In Sri Lanka, thousands of protesters stormed the presidential palace. Shortages of food, fuel and medicine have provoked widespread anger. Parliament has elected a new president. Mass protests over the past few weeks forced the former leader to flee the country amid the worst economic crisis in decades. Sri Lanka, one of the most beautiful countries in the world, but right now it is in deep trouble. The economy is in a massive mess, and as you may have seen on the news, there have been huge protests against the government for the past five months. It's got so bad that President Gotabaya Rajapaksa ran away to Singapore a couple of weeks ago and resigned. MPs replaced him with someone just as unpopular, the Prime Minister Ranil Wickremesinghe. Protesters hate him so much, they burned his house down a few weeks ago. So how did Sri Lanka, the pearl of the Indian Ocean, get into such a terrible state? And can it ever recover? There are few places on Earth as beautiful as Sri Lanka, from the verdant tea-covered hills to the stunning white beaches that go on for miles. Tourists invariably describe this island of 22 million people as warm and friendly. But despite all of Sri Lanka's natural charm, there is trouble in paradise. Sri Lanka is going through its worst economic crisis since gaining independence from Britain in 1948. Protesters have run out of patience with the government. They've been on the streets for the past five months now. They're absolutely sick of the economic mismanagement, the corruption, and they're sick of the Rajapaksa brothers, who dominated Sri Lankan politics for decades. Since the protests began in late March, the protesters have succeeded in driving them both from office. Mahinda Rajapaksa resigned as Prime Minister in May, and his younger brother, Gotabaya Rajapaksa, resigned as President in July. But only after he'd fled the country to the Maldives and then to Singapore. Gotabaya's friend, Ranil Wickremesinghe, who was serving as Prime Minister for a sixth time, then became Acting President. Amazing when you consider protesters hate him just as much as to burn down his house earlier in the month. Barely a week after he was made acting president, Sri Lanka's parliament also ignored the protesters' wishes and voted to promote Wickremesinghe from acting president to president. Many of the protesters have such a lot of anger and frustration about how he has ascended to the highest position in the land. I mean, this is a man who, a little over two years ago, lost his parliamentary seat. He was voted out of parliament by the people of Sri Lanka. Obviously, those parliamentarians, representatives of the people, but not really listening to the people's mandate. Sri Lanka's political elite have made a mess of the economy but are unwilling to let go of power. In the meantime, ordinary people must endure the effects of their incompetence. Inflation running at over 50%, shortages of food, fuel and medicines, and power cuts on a daily basis. How did it get to this? Sri Lanka is one of the better off countries in South Asia. It has the second highest GDP per capita in the region, second only to the Maldives, and ahead of Bhutan and India. Protesters say it all leads back to the Rajapaksa family and their cronies, who they say have been running Sri Lanka as if it were their own family business for years. Well, is that a fair criticism? Let's find out with our guest now. Bhavani Fonseca is a human rights lawyer. Umesh Moramudali is an economist. Patrick Boyle is a professor of finance at King's College London. And Dilrukshi Handanetti is a journalist who is a founder of the Center for Investigative Reporting in Sri Lanka. Welcome to all of you. Bhavani Fonseca, I'd like to start with you, especially as you've been out on the protests yourself. Do you think it is a fair criticism that all of Sri Lanka's current problems, especially pertaining to the economy, do lead back to the Rajapaksa family? Well, I would say the Rajapaksas are partly to blame, but it's a mo the governance model in Sri Lanka that really is the problem, which has led to a very strong executive precedent, authoritarian governance, and just allowed for an individual to make decisions with really no repercussions, which has led to this crisis. So partly the Rajapaksas, who have consolidated all this power in this one office, but there are successive leaders and governments that are to be blamed for what has happened to Sri Lanka. Dilrukshi, you want to come in on that? 
Uh, yes, I think I would like to add uh, the fact that uh, people would want to blame the government, the current government, for a multitude of other reasons as well. Uh, we, we knew that there was an economic meltdown, then there was also the pandemic, and uh, people are, everywhere people are going through difficult times. But uh, having said that, Sri Lanka is also in a way not so unique because we have seen the biggest nepotistic project in this country. You know, one whole family and number of members have been uh, having control over political power. And uh, I think because of the economic meltdown and the situation that, that it has created, the fact that people do not have the bare essentials have created a situation where people actually try do understand or try to make a link to corruption to uh, you know, grand corruption and to nepotism, you know, it's a terri terribly, you know, it's a de it's a deadly combo. Umesh, you're an economist. Um, do you think it's fair to blame the Rajapaksas for this? I think uh, significant blame has to go to Rajapaksas because uh, uh, by 2019, Sri Lanka was a very fragile economy, so they came into power again uh, in that context. And knowing that Sri Lanka was a fragile economy, they did to they did take uh, really really adamant decisions which actually put Sri Lanka in this trouble. For example, knowing that the government revenue was low, they, they made significant tax cuts, and they keep saying that they are not going to IMF, they are not restructuring debt. So they deliberately made a choice to pay foreign loans by prioritizing foreign creditors instead of uh, people. So that resulted in drying down foreign reserves entirely, and that is why we have right. uh, fuel queues today or to the electricity. So right. so this this mess wouldn't have been this bigger if Rajapaksha's handled this better, if they were not this adamant. We're going to get into the economy, the management of the economy, uh, much more deeply in a moment. We'll bring Patrick in then. But just before we move on to that, uh, I'd like to, to stay with our Sri Lankan guests. Uh, Bhavani, um, outsiders, people from watch, you know, watching from around the world, they always ask, you know, if they're so unpopular, if they're so incompetent, why have they been in charge for so long? Well, the problem is that they were extremely popular, and I would say they're still quite popular in sections of the society. Uh, but people have seen this crisis as directly linked to the Rajapaksa, so their popularity has diminished significantly. But I won't rule them back, coming back to particular officers. So they're still very much a force to be reckoned with. They are identified as defeating terrorism and uh, ensuring there's some form of stability during the previous year. So 2019, when Gotabe Rajapaks was elected, he came on that platform of stability, security, and economic prosperity. Of course, since then, it has been a spectacular disaster. But do not rule out the Rajapaksas. I think they will be back in the saddle again. Oh, that, that's an absolutely uh, crucial question. And I don't think anyone doubts that they're going to make a political comeback. In the meantime, uh, their friend um, has been, you know, been made president by the MPs, not by the people, of course. Um, just tell us a little bit about him. Why is he so unpopular? They burned his house down a few weeks beforehand. Why is he so unpopular? And what are the protesters going to do? So, Ranil Vikram Singh is now the executive president, and he came into office. He was elected by parliament, so he has followed the constitutional process. That needs to be recognized. But he's deeply unpopular among the people in Sri Lanka for the numerous failures. And he just has no connection with the people. So even when he was appointed prime minister in May, there was a lot of pushback, people calling for his resignation, and the protests still continue. So we have a president who was elected by the members of parliament, mm. but there's a question whether the public accepts his leadership. Is that because he only has, his party only has one seat in parliament? Well, his party has one seat and a new MP was elect, uh, appointed to parliament today. But it goes back to, again, this is a politician who's been around for over four decades. And many have see, many see him coming from a very particular political class. Um, and his ideologies and his positions have really not really connected with a lot of the people in Sri Lanka. Yeah. While he has very good ideas, it doesn't seem to be translating to the uh, the, the normal person in, in on the road. Yeah. Uh, Dorokshi, uh, Wakramasinghe has been prime minister six times. He's not exactly 
a fresh face. Protesters burned down his house. Uh, it, from the outside, at least, it looks like a terrible move for Parliament to make him president. Well, it seems so because uh, people do see it as a misrepresentation of any public mandate. And uh, they also people also see him, uh, whenever I talk to people, they do say that he doesn't represent uh, any political party. And, in, in, you know, you don't have the numbers. And actually, he's seen as the face of the Rajapakshas, that he is there because the Rajapaksha loyalists, the, the majority, they have a two-thirds majority in parliament, and they overwhelmingly uh, voted him in, uh, you know, in favor of him. So the, this adds to his unpopularity. This adds to his credentials of being you know, an anti-democratic force uh, in parliament. And it doesn't help to find him uh, you know, unleashing violence, control, you know, using all kinds of mechanisms to curb and co control uh, civil liberties uh, as it happens in Sri Lanka right now. Quick last question for you, Jill Rukshi, uh, before we get on to the granular details of the economy. Um, is there any chance that a strong opposition uh, might emerge in the next few years? What's holding them back? We can see that even the opposition has been divided. Um, some of some of the opposition members have uh, definitely. When I say uh, when I talk about uh, the opposition, I'm referring specifically to uh, Samagri Jana Balavege, which is led by Sajid Premadasa. So clearly, some of the members have voted in favor of uh, uh, Ranil Vikramasinghe. But having said that, you know uh, these are very um, unusual times, and then you will also see these things. At the same time, they they also feel very insecure. Houses have been burned, and a lot of a uh, lot of MPs, when you talk to them, say that they are extremely worried about their own security. Right now, I think it's also a project to protect themselves and to ensure that they are safe. You know, even before they uh, think about people. But uh, to see whether there is a real opposition. Uh, and how it becomes effective and, uh, you know, visible in the House. We will have to wait for critical legislation to come through, very, uh, you know, key decisions to be uh, made in Parliament. Right now, it's probably a little too early to get to that. Okay. But, uh, you know, we, we are talking about several months ahead, so it right. can change. OK, uh, Patrick, let's get stuck into the economy now. And uh, we've, we've heard in that report that uh, inflation is ridiculous, you know, 50-plus percent. Uh, there are food shortages, medicine shortages. Uh, there are blackouts uh, frequently. Let's get to the causes, the root causes. It might take a bit of time to explain this one, but how did Sri Lanka get itself into this financial mess? Well, Sri Lanka has been a, a bit of a knife edge economy for quite a while, um, you know, with the sort of brutal legacy of their civil war and so on. And then you, you end up, uh, you know, with a situation, you know, obviously the recent problems of the pandemic in a country that relies very heavily on tourism. Um, but, but really the biggest problem for Sri Lanka is just a huge amount of malinvestment. You know, there's convention centers and airports in the jungle. There's the famous Lotus Tower, you know, this one of the tallest buildings in, in Asia, uh, you know, that was built for no good reason. Um, you know, cricket stadiums that uh, host two games a year since they've been opened. Um, and a lot of this has been driven by, uh, you know, outside money coming in. Uh, you know, China is, is having the finger pointed at them quite a bit at the moment uh, with their Belt and Road Initiative. And the idea of the Belt and Road Initiative was to... Um, you know, to help develop trade routes. But, you know, things like, uh, you know, cricket stadiums and tall buildings, uh, you know, did nothing for, for Sri Lanka. And then when you see sort of the combined problems of um, the, the war in Ukraine driving inflation, all sorts of problems like that. Ah, it's so almost, it's, uh, a, you know, it's it a mixture a... then. It's a mixture of domestic problems and global problems. Just going back to the domestic problems, then not only did they borrow an awful lot of money for these, as you say, vanity projects that ended up being white elephants, they also printed a lot of money to fund these things. So, um, you know, it, that naturally, that's inflationary. Yes, yeah, I mean, you know, inflation is coming at Sri Lanka from, from every direction mm. at, at this point, uh, yeah. And at the same time, they were making tax cuts, as uh, Umesh mentioned, uh, massive tax cuts. Umesh, what? What was the point of making those huge tax cuts and bringing down the revenue into the Treasury? Why would they do that? These tax cuts were actually largely to support the 
crony businessmen who brought Rajapaksas to power, and also certain professional groups, because uh, people did not ask for these tax cuts, as and most of the people who benefited from these tax cuts were either the businessmen or those who are who are earning very high income. So that that is largely to get their election machine going and to benefit uh, their supporters. That has no economic rationale. They were they were like uh, we want to stimulate the growth. But it was very clear that at that point, what matters was not the growth, but the debt sustainability. So they compromised the debt sustainability and also mm -hmm. uh, compromised the ability to borrow from international capital markets uh, by by giving huge tax cuts. Because the immediate after the tax cuts, what we saw was a credit uh, credit rating downgrade, so which resulted in Sri Lanka almost uh, losing ability to borrow from international capital markets. Oh, absolutely, um, Patrick. Let's talk about that. How does the the, you know, the outside world view Sri Lanka now as an investment opportunity to lend money to, given that there's been a sovereign debt default, this is, is this going to get much more painful as a result? You know, the, the outside world, I think, doesn't look at Sri Lanka as, as an investment opportunity. It's, it's something that has to be fixed up, uh, you know, before, before anyone will really get involved. I mean, we're, you know, at the moment, Sri Lanka is looking to borrow some money from their bilateral creditors right now to get them a couple of months down the line, at which point they're hoping to get uh, money from the, uh, the IMF and, you know, basically other uh, international bailouts. But um, at the moment, uh, you know, the, the situation, the economic situation just really doesn't look very good. Patrick, there's even talk of Sri Lanka substituting its own currency when it comes to paying off, um, to paying foreign investors with the Indian rupee. Has that ever worked before? Do you think it would work in this case? I, I'm not sure that I really see exactly how it would work, but there is a sort of a long history, like even countries like Turkey, where people use the dollar an awful lot like it, it is not uncommon in in emerging markets to use just another country's currency in a situation where their own currency is so distressed or essentially uh you know can become worthless so Avani, uh, where do you project this crisis going in the coming months do you see it settling down and the country returning to normal anytime soon Unfortunately, no. I feel this is going to be at least for another couple of years. We're going to be in this situation of uncertainty and crisis mode. What we can only hope is that the new president and the government is able to get the economic situation under control. Getting a staff level agreement is critical, but also bridge financing. But it's going to take some time because the situation is very volatile on the ground. Dilrukshi, your prognosis? I think uh, I agree with Bhavani, but I also think uh, the government also has to demonstrate uh, a commitment to uh, the previous commitments made, and that is to uh, look at an interim administration where other political parties can uh, play a certain role. So this is critical because this is what was promised on July 9th, and uh, the government has completely gone away from that promise as we see uh, right now. And uh, well, unfortunately, I also see more crisis. Uh, happening because if this is the mode that we are going to be in, uh, people will protest again and it could even get ugly. Even the use of brute force, as, it, as we see now, is not going to contain people if they do not have access to essentials and also have a sense of normalcy in the country. So I don't see this, uh, you know, abating in the, in the short term, for sure. Bhavani, you know, you've been on the protests. I've read a few different articles in New York Times and elsewhere. Uh, slightly patronizing, I don't know, maybe not, maybe they're accurate, but they sort of say that, oh, Sri Lankan people are so nice and their protests are so much better than our January the 6th protest or insurrection or whatever. Oh, they're so gentle. And people go up into the palace of the uh, president and they're so orderly and they have such a fun way about them. They go swimming in his swimming pool. And uh, you know, is that what it's like? Is that what the atmosphere is like in these protests? Well, I want to be very clear. The pe protests have been very peaceful over the months, and that's been the key, I would say, characteristic, is that people have been on the streets for months and demanding for change, but violence has come from other elements. The protesters have been very much peaceful, um, but of course, when violence and intimidation is targeted towards them, you see responses 
overall, it's been a very much a peaceful citizens' mobilization, which is very remarkable across the world. Bhavani Fonseca, Umesh Patrick and Dil Rukshi, thank you all very much for your contributions to the Nexus today. And uh, we're going to move on to Sri Lanka as a tourist destination now. And we're in the middle of the summer holidays, at least in the Northern Hemisphere. And of course, people want to know if it's still safe to visit Sri Lanka, given all the protests. This is a big question, too, for Sri Lanka, as it accounts for something like 12% of the country's GDP. In a typical year before COVID, an average 2 million people were visiting the country, bringing with them all that much-needed foreign currency, something like $3 billion on average every year from 2015 to 2019. But what's going to happen this year? Let's bring in our final guest now, Gary Bowerman, a travel analyst who runs a weekly podcast called the Southeast Asia Travel Show. Gary, welcome to the programme. Uh, basically, people want to know, looking at the news, is it OK still to travel to Sri Lanka for a holiday? Yeah, hi, Matthew. It's a very good question. The airlines are still flying in and out of uh, Sri Lanka, uh, a lot from Southeast Asia, from the Middle East, even from London at the moment. So there is access into, into uh, Sri Lanka. The issue, of course, is the, the lack of uh, political stability, uh, the issues of, uh, the issues of um, street protests, and also you know, just the, the economic collapse of the country. There's very little fuel. Uh, there's little aspect, little ways of getting around the country. Um, so at the moment, it's uh, tourism has, has kind of collapsed in the past two months. They actually had quite a good start to the year, mm. um, and it's hoping that by political stability coming back later in the year, you will see more travellers coming back to Sri Lanka. Terrible news for Sri Lanka, as you said, the economy is in a mess at the moment. Inflation is incredibly high. So uh, you know, fewer tourists coming in, fewer tourist dollars and, and pounds and euros and so on. That's pretty bad news. Um, if people are going in, though, uh, any advice? I mean, they'll have to go to the main airport, Colombo, is that it? Yeah, it's, it's, if, if you're flying internationally, it's, in, it's impossible to avoid Colombo. That's, that's the main airport, and that's where everybody's flying into right now. Um, and obviously, that's where the, the, the destabilization is in the country. Um, issues in terms of actually managing your, your trip while you're there, you know, there are risks. There, there's uh, low fuel levels. Uh, medicines and even foodstuffs are in very short supply. The people are suffering. So, you know, you have to bear that in mind that there will be risks of actually traveling to the country right now. Yeah. I mean, look, Sri Lanka needs tourism and, and tourists need to be able to go to Sri Lanka. So this isn't a mercenary question. This is a, a practical question. If people are watching TV and they're saying to themselves, uh, oh, inflation's up a great deal. Perhaps, uh, you know, the currency is weak. Perhaps I can get more for my, uh, you know, euro, dollar, whatever it might be. Um, is that the case? Are they going to find uh, that um, Sri Lanka is actually quite a cheap option if they do venture to go there? Yeah, of course. I mean, as you're right, the, the currency has collapsed there, so actually traveling is, is much cheaper. You know, Sri Lanka has been hit by, by a triple whammy. It had the, the Easter bombings uh, in 2019. It had the COVID uh, impact, which really hurt its tourism industry. It did try to reopen much earlier than some other countries in Asia. Um, and it has actually started to, to draw back tourists, particularly at the beginning of this year. Um, there, is, there is a desire to travel to Sri Lanka. It's a popular destination. It will be again once political stability returns. So I don't think it's a, a mercenary question, uh, Matthew. I think it's just a case of actually trying to work out what the risks are and, and how the actual industry is going to rebuild itself. Because you know the, the, the country is in disarray right now. It's as simple as that. Once the political instability, the protests are over, how long does it take, you know, typically for tourists to return to a destination? Yeah, that's a good question. And this isn't really the first time that Sri Lanka has had problems. If we go back over the last 20, 30 years after the Civil War, even during the Civil War, tourists were going into the country. It's been a country that's been in disarray for many, many years. Uh, the, the current uh, default on debts and the economic collapse it has been a long time coming. But in terms of what happens in future, you know, if it is able to destabilize, if it is able to stabilize rather, if the country is able to secure financing from the IMF or from China or from wherever, and they can actually get political stability back on the streets, I, you know, I don't think it will be long. I think tourists will be back. Uh, I mean, normally the, the peak seasons for, for Sri Lanka are around de December through March. 
and also now, J July and August. So this, these two months, you're not going to see much. But by the back end of the year, you could start to see tourists coming back for sure. Final, final and quick question for you. Uh, where does Sri Lanka rank in the overall tourist destinations of the world? It's pretty low. It, it, I mean, it's, a, it's around about 2 million visitors per year. But I think the importance for, for Sri Lanka is, is not the total number of visitors, it's the money that it generates. As you said earlier, it's the foreign exchange that it generates. Uh, tourism is the third biggest uh, generator of foreign exchange for the country. And that shows you how important the travel industry is and how eager the government will be to get tourists coming back later in the so year. So true. Gary Bowerman, thank you so much for your advice. Much appreciated. And thank you at home and on your phones for watching. If you want to see this episode or any of our previous episodes, do go to our channel on YouTube. Just type in Nexus TRT World. Till next week then, goodbye.